So I'm really proud to be sharing my uh, recent work on adaptive horizontal gene transfer in the human gut microbiome uh, with you today. Uh, so let's get started. So the human gut microbiome is highly ecologically diverse um, with each host containing you know, hundreds or thousands of species. And many of these species are shared across hosts. So because of this, we can see how species are evolving across a global human population, right? Now, one of the most striking phenomena that's been noted is the existence of adaptive horizontal gene transfer within species. So for instance, famously, we have the case of antibiotic resistance, right? So antibiotic resistance genes um, arise within some host and then spread via horizontal gene transfer to other hosts. We empirically know this happens, but we don't really know outside of the context of adapt, you know, of antibiotic resistance, how common this is, right? Nor do we know really in general, what other kinds of genes may be spreading uh, in a similar manner, right? So in order to answer these kinds of questions, what we really need to do is identify statistical signatures of adaptive horizontal gene transfer. And that's really what our talk is about here today. So first I wanna get started on some, some basic um, diagrammatic stuff. So what we have here are, um, uh, we have two hosts, right? And within each host, we have uh, the genotype of a strain which is represented with a bar, right? Now, variants that arise will be represented with circles. So for instance, in this case, we have an adaptive variant shown in green, right? Good. Now, when we have adaptive horizontal gene transfer, the first step um, is some kind of transmission event, um, say for instance, a strain transmitting between two hosts. And then sub subsequently, we can have some kind of recombination. So for instance, we might have a homologous recombination where a section, a genetic section is, is essentially copying one strain to the other strain. And as a result, we now have a new strain that bears the adaptive variant, right? Good. So in order to detect this kind of phenomena, the first thing we need to do is understand the, you know, what the sort of genomic context into which adaptation is, is, is going to be happening. So in general, within coding regions of the genome, we'll have two types of mutations. We have synonymous mutations, right, which are, uh, they do not change the amino acid which is transcribed and therefore are very unlikely to have a fitness effect or at least a large fitness effect. And we also have non-synonymous variants which do change the amino acid which is transcribed. Um, and as a result, they can have very diverse effects on fitness. You know, they can be deleterious or beneficial, right? So uh, another important con uh, con concept for us to, to get uh, right is something called um, linkage, right? So linkage is essentially when one variant, say this variant on the left appears, how likely is it that another variant, say this one on the right, also appears on the same strain, is in, in the same strain, right? In general, nearby variants, so variants which are physically close on the genome, tend to be tightly linked. We can actually quantify this using a metric called R squared, this linkage to equilibrium. Um, and what we see is that variants which are physically close, so on the x-axis for close to zero, tend to have a high value of R squared, right? Uh, and conversely, um, distant variants, variants which are farther apart on the genome, tend to have a low value of R squared, meaning that, you know, knowing the identity at site one doesn't really tell you very much about what the identity is going to be at site two. So linkage is important because linkage is altered by um, selection, right? In particular, if we were to have sort of adaptive horizontal gene transfer where a genetic segment is being transferred from strain to strain to strain to strain, as we see here on the right, um, what we end up with is a region of elevated linkage. All of these variants really seem to show up on exactly the same haplotypes, exactly the same strains, right? Now, in addition to just a general elevation of linkage, we also specifically tend to see an elevation of non-synonymous linkage, that is a linkage between these non-synonymous variants, right? Um, while synonymous linkage also goes up, um, it's really the, the greatest increase we tend to see is in non-synonymous linkage. Um, part of this is because these are the adaptive variants, um, but there's, there's really a bunch of, um, different evolutionary models that can result in this. But the important thing is that when we see a dramatic elevation of non-synonymous linkage, it, it's really a good signature that we have some kind of positive selection driven by recombination going on, right? So greater elevations of linkage between non-synonymous variants is a good signature of um, positive selection. So given that we have uh, these, these two signatures, elevations of linkage overall, and specifically of non-synonymous variants, we then looked into a, you know, a large cohort of um, gut microbiome data, about 700 individuals, publicly available data. Um, we got the you know, shotgun sequences for each of these individuals, right? We then aligned these shotgun sequences to a reference database, and we called SNPs in the core genome. We're really interested here in kind of the most limited case of homologous recombination in the core genome, right? We're not looking at uh, mobile or accessory elements. We're really looking at sort of the, the most basic kinds of um, adaptation.
right? And then from this, we were able to extract a dominant haplotype of most species within most hosts. I, I can, if we have questions about this, I can you know, talk about how we we're able to do this. But the point is that we have essentially the type of data that you know, we've been representing with these, with these diagrams, right? We have strains, we have variants, um, and we have you know, each of them belonging to different hosts. So before we look for specific variants under selection, we first wanted to see if non-synonymous variants tend to be more tightly linked in general across the entire genome. And what we found is that, yes, they are uh, much more tightly linked uh, in general across the whole genome. So here we have two species. We can see the non-synonymous linkage in red, the synonymous linkage in light blue, and the sort of, the, you know, the, the difference between these two is, is shown in green, right? So if we plot the, the average value of this difference, we can use it as a test statistic to say, you know, how much stronger is non-synonymous linkage on average, right? And what we see is that, you know, non-synonymous linkage is, is much stronger than synonymous linkage in most of these species. Now, this is consistent with positive selection at some percentage of sites. But then the question is, which site of these, you know, which, which sites are these, right? So in order to identify the sites, um, we developed a called ILDS, right? ILDS essentially looks for regions of the genome that look like on the right, the positively selected, so essentially elevated linkage overall, and specifically elevated linkage among non-synonymous variants relative to, you know, non, you know, neutrally evolving or, you know, non-selected regions, right? Good. So, you know, if we're going to do a, a scan with ILDS, we essentially cut the genome up into, to, you know, into to windows, right? The windows have some number of variants in them. We calculate LD curves, and then we say, you know, does it look like the positively selected, um, um, you know, uh, drawing on the right? So here we have no, yes, yes, no, and within each window, we're going to essentially calculate a value of our statistic, right? So we wanted to first try our statistic out in a, uh, you know, a species that we know uh, is undergoing a um, uh, this kind of, you know, HGT mediated selective sweep, um, and it's we chose uh, C diff. Right, because C diff is known to, you know, ha have a strong positive selection at this toxin B gene. It's actually the virulence factor um, in C diff. Right, so to see what an ILDS scan looks like, here we have on the x-axis the position in the genome, and on the y-axis we're going to get the value of ILDS. Uh, we're going to calculate it in windows along the entire genome. So first we calculate ILDS. Right, and what we see is that ILDS is mostly hanging out around zero, and occasionally it has these very sharp bumps. Right. Uh, next, we can assess the significance. Is ILDS significantly elevated above zero? We have a test for that, right? We see that the places where it's significantly elevated above zero tend to be the peaks. That's good. Um, and then we group, you know, significant windows um, that are nearby to one another into peaks. Each individual peak essentially represents an independent selective event, right? So in the question, does the toxin B gene show up here? And Indeed, it does. It's actually the second highest peak, missed out on being the highest one by a very small margin. Um, so, you know, we, we, this is a good positive control for us. So next, we looked at a, you know, a, uh, a typical um, gut micro, uh, microbiome species, R. bromi, and we, we, we're going to focus here uh, for a second on the MDXEF genes, right? Um, these are involved in maltodextrin um, metabolism. Maltodextrin is a synthetic starch. Um, so um, here, we're going to look at 128 strains. This is our data set for R. bromi. Um, and we're going to essentially plot the, you know, the uh, similar to the diagrams we were making before. Each, you know, line is a, a strain, um, and you know, colors are where variants are. We're then going to group strains together if they have an identical MDX EF haplotype. So it's about 3,000 base pairs, um, and so we can see that there are, you know, a bunch of groups of identical um, MDX EF haplotype strains, right? So I think the first thing to really notice is that this you know, empirical data looks almost exactly like our, you know, expectation, right? Um, this is, you know, the, the, the model expectation, right? So I think that, you know, we have this region of elevated linkage. Within there, we have much higher non-SYN than SYN linkage. Um, and so we feel very confident in saying that this is a, a genuine selective sweep, right? So across all the species in our data set, we had about 30 really high quality species. Um, we looked at the number of genes that appear to be under selection. This ranged, um, but all you know, species had some degree, you know, some genes that were under selection. Erectile had a large number, you know, Collinsell had a small number. Um, and if we look at the number of independent peaks, right, these are independent selective events. What we saw is that we have about five sweeps on average per species. Um, and then kind of our the last thing we wanted to do is look at are there functional categories that tend to be enriched among the sweeps? So interestingly, maltodextrin metabolism genes 
um, showed up in, in a bunch of different species. It was actually highly statistically significant. Um, this may represent some kind of adaptation to Western diets, but you know, this is a point that we're, we're looking um, further in, you know, into further. Um, we also found that starch utilization system genes, these SUS genes, famously SUS-C and SUS-D, also were repeatedly under selection. Um, and another class of, of uh, genes that seem to be under selection frequently were these transcriptional regulators, right? Um, so just to wrap up, um, you know, we can say that positive selection results in tight linkage between non-synonymous variants, right? That was the first finding. Um, we also found that non-synonymous variants are under positive selection in human gut microbiome species by looking at the kind of the whole genome, right? So some, you know, some set of non-synonymous variants. Um, and we also developed a statistic called ILDS and used it to recover signatures of many across those selective sweeps that were mediated by horizontal gene transfer. So with that, um, I'd like to um, give some acknowledgements to my advisor uh, and co-author, uh, Dr. Nandita Garud, um, as well as members of the Garud Lab and you know, our funding sources. Um, if you're interested in the paper, uh, it's still a preprint right now. Um, and um, you know, my contact information is there in the lower right as well. So thank you for listening to my talk.